Hello, um, this, my name is Hernan Garcia and I want to welcome you all to the uh, NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of this seminar is to showcase examples of NOAA's leadership in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. I would like to take a moment for a few webinar details. First, I would like to thank the uh, NOAA Research Council and the awesome team I work with in putting together these seminars without whom none of this will happen. Uh, Tracy Gill with NOAA uh, National Ocean Service, uh, Sandra Clark with NOAA uh, Nestes, Office of the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, and Katie Rowley uh, with the NOAA Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research, uh, NOAA Central Library. Uh, we often have staffers assist us with the NOAA leadership seminars during the Q&A, and today we have David Hall. Uh, Public Affairs Officer for the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, uh, who will moderate the questions and answers along with Tracy Gill. Second, I would like to share with you some seminar logistics. Uh, these are all also listed in the Q&A box online. All attendees are muted. Uh, please type all your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time, and we will address as many of them as we can at the end of the seminar. Uh, we are also recording this seminar for later viewing. Today's uh, seminar is titled People, Platform, and Culture, The Roadmap to Sustainable Excellence. And our speaker is Rear Admiral Nancy Hahn. She is the Deputy Director for Operations of the NOAA Office of Marine and Aviation Operations and Deputy Director of the NOAA Commission Officers Corps. I would like to share with you just a few highlights of Admiral Han's distinguished career. Admiral Han is responsible for leading and managing NOAA's Office of Marine and Aviation Operation uh, assets, including the agency's fleet for, of research and survey vessels and aircraft. She has served in many operational and management leading roles and assignments. Emil Hans has served aboard NOAA aircraft as both a pilot and flight meteorologist and has supported many scientific missions. She has served as executive officer at the NOAA Marine Operations Center Atlantic, associate director of the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory of OAR, and NOAA liaison to the U.S. Pacific Command. On the other hand, Holmes holds a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University, a master's degree in aeronautical science and space studies from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and a bachelor's degree in marine science and biology from the University of San Diego. And well, with that, a little hand, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hernan, and thank you, Tracy, and the whole team for making this possible. I appreciate all the work that, that goes into putting on this leadership seminar. And thank you to all of you for, for making the time uh, to have this conversation today. So I definitely want to leave you know, at least half the time for questions and, and conversations and make this time useful, useful and interesting for you. So as Hernan mentioned, I'm going to talk today about the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. I'll talk about who we are, what we do, and why it's important to the American public. And I, and I would argue to each of you, and we'll, we'll put that question up at the end. Um, and then I'll talk about our strategic plan, which is based on three primary tenets, the people, the platforms, and the culture, and how important this is to sustainable excellence in our organization, which ultimately translates across NOAA as we support all of, all of the line offices in NOAA. So Hernan talked about me, and I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about the NOAA Corps and how we are a part of the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations workforce, but the NOAA Corps is not the only part of OMAO uh, workforce, and that, that's a really important part we'll talk about when we talk about the people. I've been in my career 23 years. I've worked for NOAA. Um, I worked as a civilian starting out as an observer on fishery oceanography, fishery vessels, commercial fishery vessel, and then a scientist on um, oceanography vessels in the UNOLS and in the NOAA fleet, um, the academic and NOAA fleet. So I've been very uh, fortunate to have this career 
and, and very fortunate to work across NOAA broadly um, with many of the people in the missions. So what does OMI do? What is our, what is our purpose? So these are mission and vision statements, um, and I'll talk about how we do these. We do this, as Hernan mentioned, with the fleet of ships, NOAA's fleet of ships, uh, NOAA's fleet of aircraft. We also do it with uncrewed systems, um, supporting uncrewed systems across NOAA, uh, with the NOAA diving program, um, the NOAA small boat program. So we, we apply it in a variety of assets across NOAA to NOAA's prioritized mission. So our mission overall is to optimize the observational platforms and our unique workforce, which I'll talk about, to meet NOAA's mission of science, stewardship, and service. Um, and our vision is to protect environmental security through intelligence and stewardship. So let's talk about who we are first. The Office of Marine and Aviation Operations is comprised of about 1,100 people. Um, the NOAA Commission Corps, which is a uniform service, it's not in the Department of Defense. We're in the Department of Commerce, just as NOAA is. Um, we're a uniform service. So, Similar to the other uniform services, um, both military um, and the public health service, which is a, a sister service under the uniform services. Um, we work on orders, uh, we deploy, we switch between assignments, um, and within a career, we'll rotate between operational and land-based assignments. In the operational assignments, uh, we crew the ship, the bridge of the ships or the wardroom of the ships. Um, we fly the aircraft. Uh, serve as flight meteorologist in some cases on the aircraft, uh, pilot uncrewed systems, and then we also serve onshore. So we're integrated across all of NOAA's line offices throughout all of NOAA's missions. And we really provide that bridge between the operational um, execution and the scientific expertise and make sure that we can get the science done, that we help get the science done. And we also saw, serve above aboard the small boats. Uh, we serve as divers. And we serve within the Department of Defense. As Hernan mentioned, one of my assignments was a liaison officer to um, the Pacific Command, which is one of the nation's combatant commands, or COCOMs. Uh, we serve as Coast Guard liaisons, as Navy liaisons, and then we serve more broadly in the Department of Commerce. So we are deployed and we serve where, where NOAA needs us and switch assignments on average about every uh, two to three years. But we are only one part of Omeo's workforce. In addition, we have wage mariners or professional mariners, and they, they serve, they staff all of the departments on the ship. So the engineers, the deck department, the stewards or the cooks, um, the survey technicians, the electrical technicians. So um, they really are the knowledge and the horsepower of keeping the ships operating um, and collecting the data. Uh, we also have CAPS employees, so a system probably many of you are familiar with in government. We have GS employees. We also have public health services, a very important part of our, our workforce. So the public health service, another uniform workforce, they serve um, within our IT, our computer departments, providing expertise alongside civilians. And then they also uh, staff our medical a branch. So within it, we have marine medicine, diving medicine, aviation medicine, and then overall workforce, which is a really important part of, of um, the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. Um, of note that that marine, that medical force um, from the public health service has been absolutely critical during COVID. There's some feedback. Someone could put it on mute, maybe. Thank you. Uh, so during COVID, uh, we have continued operations. So we took a break for a few months while we developed our protocols to maintain safety. Uh, but since June of last year, we have been operating the ships and the aircraft um, in support of prioritized requirements at near, uh, at near capacity, near a normal schedule. That has been really difficult to do safely. Um, and we have kept COVID off of the ships um, and except for one uh, one instance at the beginning off of the aircraft completely and kept people safe. And that's really been driven by the public health service and our marine operations personnel. So again, 1,100, 1100 people, um, six distinct workforces. We also have contractors. So not just the NOAA Corps make up OMAO, um, but we have a very diverse group of people that come um, from academia, from industry, from other government services, um, and that, that's really the most special thing about OMAO. 
you can see some snapshots here of, of that team. Um, definitely, definitely the best part of the job is the people that we work with. So platforms. So uh, NOAA has a fleet of 15 ships, um, 10 aircraft, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. Uncrewed systems, which aren't just in OMEO, those are across NOAA, and, and NOAA has been working in uncrewed systems, both aircraft and marine, for, for decades. This is nothing new. Um, the NOAA Uncrewed Operations Center uh, was recently established in OMEO, and that's to help um, apply those assets across NOAA in the most efficient way and for us to support in doing so. Um, small boats, so there's, we'll talk about it more, but there's about 400 small boats in NOAA and OMEO manages the small boat uh, safety program and then divers. So just over uh, 400 divers, I believe in NOAA and we manage the NOAA diving center and the NOAA diving program, which conducts the training, um, manages, maintains equipment, the safety protocols, the marine medicine. So pretty extensive um, diving program. You can see from the photos here, just, just snapshots. So it includes the ships, it includes the aircraft. Um, in the upper, let's see if I can get the, the pointer work. In the upper left-hand corner, uh, you can see an uncrewed systems being launched off of, off of a ship right here. So a lot of, we look for using the uncrewed systems as a force multiplier off of the ships and the aircraft. Um, we launch right here, we have the G4, which is our high altitude jet. And the P3, this is one of the two P3s we have. Um, and in the summer, these are Hurricane Hunter aircraft, so we'll talk a little more about those. Um, you can see a marine system here, so again, launching off a ship and leveraging that uncrewed technology to be a force multiplier uh, to NOAA's ships. So a very broad mission, then you see down here, we have a diver. So a broad mission that touches all aspects of, of NOAA, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a following slide. So let's talk specifically about the aircraft. NOAA has 10 aircraft and the King Air right here. Uh, we recently just had one delivered about three months ago. They're in the middle of their calibration flights. This is the first new aircraft that NOAA's had in 10 years, so that's very exciting. We now have two of these King Air aircraft. The two P3 aircraft, you may know these as the Hurricane Hunters. These are actually from the early 70s. We recently put new wings, new avionics, and new engines on these to keep them flying because there is currently no other aircraft in the world that can fly the mission and collect the type of data that we do, largely driven by the tail Doppler radar that's in a tail cone on the back of the plane. These aircraft outside of hurricane season fly a variety of missions. We do an air chemistry mission, which is really important for understanding um, air quality for different municipalities and, and planning for that air quality um, and the components that go into it. Uh, we fly tornado research. Uh, we fly an ocean winds program, which is up in the North Atlantic in the winter, and that's actually to do satellite uh, calibration. Um, the G4, so this is our high altitude hurricane hunter that flies above and around uh, the systems to really help impact um, accuracy in the hurricane track and intensity forecast. It also has a tail Doppler radar. There's three airborne tail Doppler radars in the world. One is on this aircraft and two are on this. So NOAA has all three of those airborne uh, tail Doppler radars, which are incredibly important for accurate hurricane forecast. In addition, this G4 aircraft flies uh, atmospheric rivers, which are the weather systems that come across the Pacific in the winter and um, provide most of the rainfall, most of the precipitation that falls. So understanding what's coming across those systems, how it will impact um, municipality, flooding, agriculture, anything that depends on water is really important. We fly Grav D, which is uh, revalidating the gravimeter fields across the world. That's important as a baseline uh, for flooding models, which are based on those, on those um, gravimeter, gravimeter fields and altitudes that are established. We have this, this aircraft, uh, which we call the, the jet prop or the turbo prop. It's actually going to be retired, uh, which the King Air finishes its calibration flights. The new King Air will replace this mission. The primary mission of this aircraft, which the King Air is taking over, um, is snow survey. So we fly before the snow falls to find out what the soil moisture equivalent is in the soil. And then after snow falls, um, we fly and measure the water equivalency in the snow. That's really important to provide water planning forecasts for flooding, 
uh, for water sources in the municipalities. This is a pretty extensive project that we fly almost year round. In addition, this King Air does emergency response. So we fly the hurricanes uh, to help inform accurate forecast, but afterwards uh, we're often tasked to fly King Air, the twin otter above it can also do it. So we'll talk about that. But the King Air will put in a very high resolution camera and will fly over the sites and take images. Those images are posted almost real time um, to Google Maps, to Google Earth. And you can actually go in and zoom in just like you could on any you know Google Earth product and see if your house is there, if your business is there. Um, and of interest, first responders use this information to figure out where to deploy limited assets. Um, in a storm that a post storm that we flew, they also located through it. Uh, someone had spelled out help, and that's how emergency responders knew to go there and help rescue people. So that imagery is really important. We fly it after tornadoes as well, in um, coordination with FEMA. Um, and then the the twin otters. We have four twin otters. These are really kind of like the pickup truck. So you can put a lot of variable payloads. In the bottom of these aircraft, they can also be heavily configured to fly air chemistry missions, um, just as the P-3s can fly emergency response. They can fly the snow survey. They fly an Arctic heat uh, project, which helps um, collect data in the Arctic. And they fly a lot of marine mammal or protected species missions. We'll identify, we'll locate, and photograph with the scientific teams um, the endangered uh, northeast right whales. Um, populations of seals, turtles, there's quite a few different species that we study for NOAA. So in a nutshell, this is what the aircraft do. They're extremely versatile um, and we have, there are far more requirements in NOAA uh, to fly than we are able to with the aircraft. We have an aircraft recapitalization plan um, to help meet those needs into the future. The delivery of the new Queen Air was the first aircraft within that. And then we also currently have underway a new high altitude jet, which will be a G550. Um, it's a later version of this G4. It will be the most capable climate aircraft in the world. So it will have the tail Doppler radar, but it will also have multiple um, ports on the bottom and on the top of the aircraft for instrumentation. It will have hard points on the wings where you can attach instrumentation. Um, it will have a nose boom uh, where you can put uh, collect data streams for um, anal analyzing kind of clean airflow before it's um, within within the, the airflow of the aircraft. So that aircraft is scheduled to be online and flying by May of 2024 um, for hurricane season of 24. So we're very excited. We're actually starting to look at the replacement aircraft for these P3s. Um, and, and the timeline is we need to have the new aircraft online and operational by 2030 um, when we need to retire these aircraft. So a lot of exciting um, recapitalization hopefully in the future for NOAA aircraft. Um, in addition, we're trying to get a fifth twin otter just to meet the requirements because the requirements far exceed the, the capacity and then a third King Air. So exciting times ahead for NOAA aircraft. Okay, NOAA ships. So we have 15 NOAA ships. Um, all of the aircraft are based in Lakeland, Florida. That's where aircraft operations is located. They deploy, the aircraft deploy around the world, around the country. Um, many of the aircraft will not see home, will not see Lakeland, Florida for months at a time. The ships have home ports, as you can see here, uh, that are located across the United States. So we start up in the Northeast, um, in Newcastle, New Hampshire, we have the Ferdinand Hassler. As we come down to Newport, Rhode Island, uh, we have the Henry Bigelow, uh, a, a, large, a vessel that largely does fisheries research. And the Okanos Explorer, um, which does a lot of exploration work, is also based in Newport, Rhode Island. Thomas Jefferson does a lot of the hydrographic work, and I'll talk more about these missions um, out of Norfolk, Virginia. The Nancy Foster and the Ron Brown are based out of Charleston, South Carolina. And then down in the Gulf in Pascagoula, we have the Oregon II, which does a lot of fisheries work. Uh, the Pisces, which does quite a bit of fisheries, and the Gunter, which does quite a bit of fisheries, all located in uh, home ported in Pascagoula. So we come around to the west coast, we have the Reuben Lasker, um, does a lot of fisheries work as well as other missions out of San Diego. The Bell Shimada focuses on fisheries work. The Rainier focuses on um, hydrographic work in Newport, um, Oregon. That's where our Marine Operations Center Pacific and our overall Marine Operations Center are in Newport, um, Oregon. And then up in Ketchikan, Alaska, the Fairweather, another hydrographic ship. And then the Oscar Dyson is in Kodiak. 
And then in Honolulu at the, the NOA Regional Center, where many of the, the other NOAA line offices um, have a presence, we have the SETI. So as you can see, the ships are spread across the U.S. Sometimes they, you know, they'll make it back to their home port frequently, but often they'll, in the case of the Ron Brown, it will do a round-the-world trip and may not see its home port of Charleston for over a year. So the, the vessels um, cover quite a bit of ground and operate out of whatever location is necessary for the science that they're undertaking. So just like the aircraft, the ships really touch all parts of NOAA. The hydrographic ships, as I mentioned, so largely it's the Tom and Je Thomas Jefferson, the Ferdinand Hassler, um, the Fairweather, and the Rainier. These ships' primary mission is to collect data for hydrographic charts. So the charts of the ocean that you know are used recreationally, used for the military, used for commercial um, shipping, this data is largely collected by NOAA um, and processed into the charts uh, that they use. This is really important for the United States. The, the commerce related to ports is a $5.4 trillion annually. And as many of you have seen with the, you know, the, the recent um, incident in the, the canal, you know, a stoppage in the safe navigation, a stoppage in the movement um, of commerce by ships has major impacts across the world. So having these, this, these charts and this data is really important for safe navigation. We do that routinely and then we're also to, called upon to do it in emergency response mode. So when large storms, when hurricanes come up some of the major U.S. ports, um, whether it's Hampton Roads here by Norfolk, Charleston, Savannah, um, we will be called in by the captain of the port, uh, which is a Coast Guard officer, to clear the channels. So once a storm comes up, all traffic will be stopped either inside at the docks or outside on, at anchor, which they call on the hook, and they will stay there until we map the channels, um, we map the passages, and we provide that data to the Coast Guard captain of the port, and when they deem it safe to open the channels, they will open it. So we will often come in, um, and before a storm makes landfall, we'll kind of hide out somewhere safe, so as soon as that storm passes, we can get in there and start that survey um, and get commercial navigation at sea uh, back to work as quickly as possible. Um, the vessels that con conduct fisheries work, um, that informs a lot of the information that sets the commercial fisheries quota, um, sets recreational fisheries quota. So the data collected that NOAA collects um, on NOAA ships is really important to help inform the sustainable management of the nation's fisheries. Uh, the Ron Brown does a lot of oceanographic and meteorological work. So, so things I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the impacts of ocean acidification on the global um, climate, of um, planning um, does a lot of work around the world so buoy deployments and recoveries which are part of international arrays and help inform weather models and climate forecast the, the foster does quite a bit of work diving so along the eastern seaboard the gulf and even in the the caribbean um, will dive really important data to understand the health and conditions of of coral reefs for one thing um, I think we've covered a lot of it. So those are the major missions. Again, we touched the data we collect at sea really touches on all the missionaries of NOAA. Um, and we do this in conjunction with um, other national assets such as the academic fleet, as well as international um, assets and, and data series. So in addition to the ships and aircraft, um, about half of NOAA's at sea and airborne data collection occurs by charters. Charters are a really important part of the data that NOAA collects. Um, there's very specific places where charters make sense. There's specific places where NOAA ships and aircraft make sense, and that's a symbiotic relationship. We want to make sure that the aircraft and the vessels that NOAA uses are safe, and so OMEO provides the service um, to review and sign off on charters and make sure that they meet safety requirements to keep NOAA personnel safe. As I mentioned, NOAA has just over 400 small boats. Those are spread across the NOAA line offices and programs. Um, and NOAA's role is, as you can see here, to oversee the policy, the safety, the procedures, training, and inspections. Again, we want to make sure that those safe boat, those small boats um, are safe for people using them across NOAA. And then the NOAA diving program. So there's over about there's over 400 divers across NOAA, again, those are in all the lineups, all the programs, they support the critical collection of data, and we want to make sure it's safe. So 
We conduct the training uh, through the NOAA Dive Center. We service all the gear. Um, so everyone uses standardized gear. Um, we issue that gear. Uh, we service that gear and make sure people are safe. Um, we issue the handbook and the policies and the procedures. And then working closely with the um, NOAA uh, Dive Safety Board, which has representatives from across NOAA. That's a really important part of conducting, collecting data um, by dives and doing it safely. That's another part of what we do. And then on crude systems. So as I mentioned, on crude systems have been used across NOAA for decades. This is not new. What is new is that there's a NOAA on crude operations center, and that was established within OMAO uh, last year. So we approve the use of all uncrewed aircraft systems. Um, we review it, we sign off. That includes airworthiness, um, the operational plan. Uh, we provide guidance for coordination with the FAA, so airspace clearance. Um, and provide pilots and maintainers um, when needed, provide training. So in the cases where the scientists or people in other line offices operate them, which often makes most sense, um, we oversee that training again to make sure there's a standardized level of safety. We've expanded that too to marine systems. So, you know, really understanding and as we grow the program, where does it make sense for us to buy and operate uh, vehicles, marine and aircraft? I mean, as you can see here, partners and collaborations, which occur across NOAA, it's not just OMAO, but where can we partner with um, Department of Defense? We partner heavily with the Navy, um, with the Coast Guard to leverage vehicles and capabilities that they have. Um, and then through C-Note legislation, we're working closely with partners across the Gulf and up in the new Northeast um, to leverage vehicles uh, with universities and government that exist. Uh, we recently signed an agreement with the University of Southern Mississippi um, and have started working closely with them as we do with many other academic institutions. The UXS in NOAA is largely um, it's overseen by the Executive Oversight Board. So I, along with my counterpart in the Office of um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, co-chair this board. It has representatives from across NOAA, and this is a really critical role to um, provide guidance on uh, policy, on cybersecurity, on privacy issues, really anything that touches the operations of uncrewed systems is what this group focuses on. So uncrewed systems is definitely a growing area um, across NOAA and within the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, you know, we don't use these necessarily just independent of the ships and aircraft. We launch them from the ships. Um, we even launch them from the aircraft. So while we're flying in a hurricane, we'll launch it from the aircraft and it can fly low altitudes um, just above the water, that low altitude kind of air sea interface area that, you know, the top 100 meters above the water where collection of data is critical to accurate forecast, but it's not a safe place to fly aircraft. So really figuring out how to use these as force multipliers to improve the products and services that NOAA provides. So no, uh, OMAO developed a strategic plan, um, I guess about six months ago we published it, a five-year strategic plan, and it is extremely focused on metrics. So it spells out exactly what we're going to do year by year for our people, our platforms, and our culture to make sure that we provide the absolute best service to NOAA in collecting this data, and we do it in a sustainable way. So people are the number one thing. If we don't have you know, a very experienced workforce um, who is trained, who is engaged, who is enjoying where they work, we can't achieve anything else. So it really are, all starts with our people here. Part of our strategic plan is to focus on um, continuing to recruit and retain the specialized workforce. I mean, the workforce, as we've discussed, you know, includes anything from an engineer who's responsible for, you know, the operations, the power plant of a ship, um, to a pilot that operates an uncrewed aircraft system, um, to people who are experienced in budget and logistics and all the things that are required to make these operations go. Um, so really focused on, on the people, making sure we're providing them the training that they need. That's been a major priority um, in the last three years. We've established a training division that specifically focuses on training um, and working across the best training opportunities in government, um, in the commercial sector with other uh, military organizations to figure out how to best train our workforce. Looking at staffing, so, you know, we 
have a lot of competition with the, the private sector, with the commercial sector, um, where mariners often will be, you know, a month on, a month off, or two months on and a month off. Um, and within government hiring, you know, we're restricted to things we can do. So really focus on trying to find staffing models where we can have those rotational opportunities and get people the rest um, they need because the time that they are at work is very demanding. Um, and and it, the days are long and it's seven days a week. So focused on increasing the rotational staffing to make it a, a good, sustainable career for people. And then total worker health. So I mentioned that the importance of that public health service cadre within the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. We have been a leader in establishing a total work health, a total worker health program. This is really a shift of focusing on the whole person, the holistic person. So yes, we need them to be uh, physically ready and qualified to do the demands of the job at sea, in the air, but we also focus on making sure that they are um, mentally, mentally fit, mentally happy, have the, the support and the outlets that they need um, to balance the demands of the job and the demands of life. So. We've really focused on the whole person, um, the whole employee, and, and implementing programs to support people um, in a proactive mechanism, provide them information on stress management, provide them um, the, the tools that they need to manage stress, and then also in a reactive mode um, when treatment is needed, make sure that we have them in the best possible treatment um, and, that, and that we take care of them. The second thing is platform. So I mentioned the aircraft recapitalization program. That's a big step forward for NOAA. First new aircraft in 10 years. You know, the high altitude jet, the G550 coming online is going to be a game changer. Um, and then the additional aircraft I mentioned. We also have been focused on recapitalizing the ships. So of NOAA's 15 ships, half of them were handed to us at the end of their service life, meaning, you know, the Navy or others had used them. Um, and said, do you want them? We said yes, because we had nothing else, but that's not the optimal way to meet NOAA's at-sea requirements um, or provide the best possible platform for our workforce and for the scientists. So through a fleet recapitalization plan, similar to the aircraft recapitalization plan, we are bringing new ships online. We have a very ambitious uh, plan, which has had an annual um, appropriation or annual funding support since 2016. In December, we've signed a contract for the first two new vessels, which is really exciting. Um, they'll be derivatives of the Ride, the Sally Ride or the Armstrong, if you're familiar with those from the academic fleet. Um, and we're working with a yard in the Gulf that won the contract named Thomas E. So that work is underway to build those two new ships. And then we also, those will be oceanographic, focused on oceanographic type work. Um, and then we look ahead to the next ships in that. Uh, which will be charting and surveying uh, vessels. We have three vessels that are currently over 50 years. They're coming up on 53 years. Um, and ships are usually built to operate 30 or 35 years. So um, they've quite extended their intended service life. We're really excited about this opportunity in NOAA to design and build ships that are specifically for NOAA's purpose. Um, and we are looking at how to integrate the best technologies in those ships, whether it's the instrumentation that we deploy the sensors that are mounted on the holes, or ways that we can integrate um, uncrewed technologies, both aircraft and marine. Um, so within the strategic plan, we spell out specifically what we plan to do year by year to bring these new ships online, um, to uh, really leverage the current assets that we have, increase the days at sea um, with funding, um, and deliver the best possible service with the ships and the aircraft and the uncrewed systems um, to meet NOAA's science needs, NOAA's data needs. So culture. Culture has been, you know, a top priority of mine um, and, and my boss, my predecessor who just retired, um, as well as many people across OMAO and in NOAA. Um, you know, our expectation is that it's a place that's welcoming to everybody. Uh, that everyone has an equal chance to succeed, an equal chance to progress and succeed as, as they want to. This has been a big priority for the organization, um, and it has it's really made a big change in the organization. So we we've we've approached this from multiple facets. Um, we conduct training around respectful workplace, um, and it's really a dialogue. It's not talking at people and telling them what they should and shouldn't do. It's a dialogue of 
you know, what happens in our workforce? What kind of workforce workplace do we want to have? What is each of our roles in making, you know, ensuring that we have a respectful workplace that is welcoming to every person and provides every person an opportunity to succeed. Um, the workforce has really embraced having a respectful workplace and it, it's been probably the most rewarding part of my career is just to see how the team has embraced it. Uh, both the team within Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, but also those who sail and fly um, and operate with us. You know, going to sea and being deployed on aircraft projects is not easy. It's demanding you're away from your family, you're away from your friends. You know, you often work seven days a week. So having, having a respectful, welcoming culture is extremely important, um, not just for, you know, not just for job satisfaction, but for the safety of our operations. So within our strategic plan, we spout exactly what that looks like. You know, we're going to ensure we have a safe and respectful workplace for every employee every single day. We're focused on improving the diversity of our workforce, um, having conversations about what inclusion looks like and how we can continue to improve that. And, and that's really the key to the sustainable excellence in OMAO and continuing to apply, you know, these assets, new ships, new aircraft, um, crewed systems, um, to have the best workforce and meet NOAA's requirements. I mean, ultimately the data that we collect, that our people collect on these assets are incredibly important to the nation for commerce. I talked about the $5.4 trillion that moves through our ports, um, but that also applies, you know, commerce is heavily dependent on fisheries, on accurate weather forecasts, on accurate climate modeling. And so that the information that we collect every day you know, feeds the nation's economic security. It feeds national security, public safety through the hurricane forecasts, as well as many other missions. So, you know, we're very, uh, we, we take our mission very seriously and our workforce is very committed to making sure that we do it in a safe, respectful way and that that's sustainable for years and years to come. So with that, I'll stop and um, turn it over to David Hall, our OMEO Public Affairs Officer, to lead us through any questions and conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Admiral. Um, I'm just going to do a quick transition here to get the webcams up. Um, okay. okay. So if David and the Admiral would uh, start their webcams. Uh, David's going to be moderating those questions. Uh, David, are you ready for the first question? I am, Tracy, and thank you so much, and thanks to Renan and to uh, Admiral Hunt, of course. Um, hello, and a very happy Earth Day to all our guests today. Um, thank you for joining us. Again, my name is David Hall, and it's uh, my pleasure to moderate the Q&A portion of this seminar. Um, so uh, please submit your question using the chat box, and we'll get to as many as we can in the time we have. So the uh, first question uh, we have is from Ryan, which is actually a two-part question, and thank you, Ryan. Uh, Admiral, he asks if uh, OMAO aircraft have ever been used for turbulence and icing studies. So we'll start with that, and then mm. I'll, then I'll uh, give you the follow-up. Okay. So that's a good question, Ryan. I, to my knowledge, many decades ago, we did use the aircraft for that. In the 23 years I've been in, we have not done those projects that I'm aware of, but I do remember stories from the past when we did some of those. Um, I'd say we do a lot of testing when we fly in hurricanes and tornadoes and some of the other uh, pretty extreme weather environments, but from what I recall, there were specific studies for that decades ago, not anything that I, has been during my tenure. Okay. Um, he's also asking uh, whether or NOAA pilots uh, submit pilot reports uh, or PIREPs as they, as they are called uh, when they're mm -hmm. in flight. And obviously we have data coming off the P3 and the G4 uh, when they're flying their mm -hmm. missions and you, you spoke about the data from the King Air flights being available to the public. Are there other ways in which uh, pilots communicate what they're observing? We do. Mm -hmm. So we do. I was a pilot as one of my assignments and we do submit PIREPs. So if we go through turbulence or we go through other um, whether we will report it will be in uh, communication with air traffic control and help provide that information. So, and, and one thing to build on too, David mentioned, so when we're flying um, through the hurricanes, we have satellite communication. So the data that we're collecting is transmitted down to the ground and used real time. So when we're flying hurricanes, which are about an eight to nine hour flight, that data will be collected and transmitted via satellite 
um, and collected by the National Hurricane Center, and they'll be integrated in that in the forecast. So forecasts will come out, um, including and based on data we collected while we're still in the air, which is pretty neat. Um, we have satellite communications on all of the aircraft, so we can send out uh, some data real time. Great. Uh, thank you, Admiral. And uh, Ryan, I hope that answers your question. Uh, now let's uh, turn to Lisa's question. Uh, she is asking about the plan uh, for recapitalizing the fisheries survey vessels. Mm -hmm. So within the recapitalization plan, Lisa, um, we divided it into four classes of ships, and those are based on the primary and secondary mission areas. Um, NOAA currently has five F FSBs or fishery survey vessels, and those are actually our newest ships. But as we get uh, in the recapitalization plan, the class D or the fourth class of ship um, are focused on the living marine resources, which are the, the trawl capable fisheries vessels. Class C, which is the, four, the third, so it goes class A, Alpha, B, Bravo, C, Charlie, D, Delta. Class C, which are the third class of ships, um, will be smaller, um, trawl capable, but smaller vessels that are intended to work um, in the near shore or shallow areas. So they're both, both the smaller and the larger uh, fishery trawl capable vessels are included in the recapitalization plan. The timing of it is really contingent on funding. So right now we have an annual funding stream that's dictating how quickly we can bring the new vessels online. Um, and any bump in funding would allow us to speed it up. But but yeah, they're, they're in there both for the smaller and the larger uh, trawl capable vessels. Okay. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Uh, now turning to the hydrographic survey vessels, Eric is asking if the new ships will replace mm -hmm. the Rainier and sister ship, the Fairweather. Yes, so the recapitalization plan wasn't developed to be a replacement for ships, but to pick up the requirements that exist. So the first two new ships, the first one will go to Honolulu and will be an addition there because um, there are ships that have come offline there. So the first new ship will go there. The second new ship um, will go to Newport, Rhode Island. And again, it will be focused on doing a lot of the, the exploration work. The two Class B ships, those are the charting and mapping uh, vessels. Um, those have, we have not identified the home port and the mission for those, but the Fairweather and the Rainier are definitely long in the tooth. They're 53 years old, so it is likely that they'll pick up the missions that those two ships currently do. Those final decisions haven't been made, but they are two of the oldest ships. Uh, uh, thank you again, Ryan, for, uh, for that question. Uh, Rebecca is asking about the relationship between uh, state fish and game entities and OMAO. Do we work with those partners? Mm -hmm. So we do work with state entities a lot. Um, some of that work, a lot of that work occurs at the scientist level. So within the fishery service itself or within the National Ocean Service is where a lot of that collaboration um, occurs. As far as operations OMAO, I mean, we collect data, we'll sail with partners from state agencies, from academic institutions, from um, EPA. We have a lot of other agencies and organizations, state, federal, academic, that will sail on our ships. And, and oftentimes in a scientific party, you know, we'll have people from multiple agencies or groups on board. So a lot of the direct interaction occurs at the scientific level, the sharing of data, the, the publication, the application to products and services. But we see a lot of that um, aboard the right. operations, uh, too. Uh, John is asking what the governing processes uh, for NOAA and uh, mail-related uh, uh, acquisition, ship acquisition uh, is ships and aircraft. Um, so a few things. So we, above a certain uh, dollar amount, we'll work with both with NOAA acquisition, but also with Department of Commerce acquisition um, based on on the federal the federal guidelines. The handbook will follow those acquisition regulations. So that largely dictates you know, how we issue the contract mechanisms, how we conduct um, the evaluation of the proposals, or we, so we issue the RFP, the request for proposals, how those proposals are um, reviewed and ranked, and then ultimately how the contracts are awarded. So we, we follow the FARS, the federal acquisition um, regulations and work with NOAA and the Department of Commerce. In the case of the first two new vessels, the Class A vessels I mentioned, um, that was assisted acquisition with the Navy, with PMS 325, their shipbuilding group. Um, and we'll continue to work with them as we go into the other ship uh, recapitalization. So it's kind of a, a combination. We follow the FARs, we follow the government regulations. You know, We're led uh, by the acquisition team at NOAA and Department of Commerce, which is exceptional. 
and then we'll partner with the Navy or other groups um, where, where it makes sense to leverage our collective okay. expertise. Um, <laughs> that and, uh, thank that you question. to John for that one. Uh, Charles uh, has commented that sea time aboard NOAA vessel seems very competitive. Um, what is the process for uh, proposing a yearly survey on uh, an OMAO fisheries vessel, for example? So that's a good question. There are far more requirements for the aircraft and the ships than we can meet. Um, we are putting forward, you know, Op, we're putting forward requests to increase the funding so we can offer more days at sea. But the process right now is within NOAA, um, all of the line officers or programs submit their prioritized needs for ships and aircraft. Those are in two separate systems. Each line office then ranks their priorities from basically one to N. So they rank it from their highest priority to their lowest priority. And then based on the variable operations budget that we're able to put forward, um, based on our budget, um, the group of, called a fleet working group which has a representative from every line office. They'll then look at all those needs. They'll look at the fleet of ships and figure out how they're gonna make the schedule for the year. That ultimately results in a fleet allocation plan, which is kind of our, our fiscal year roadmap for sailing. And then our aircraft allocation plan, which is kind of our fiscal year roadmap for where we're gonna fly the aircraft. So it really starts at the line office level. OMEO does not prioritize the science. So we operate the ships, the aircraft, the uncrewed systems. Um, in priority of NOAA science needs, but we don't prioritize those. It occurs through that fleet council, that fleet okay, working great. group process. Uh, uh, thank you, Charles, for that question. Uh, Douglas uh, has asked if NOAA is using biofuel for ship propulsion. So we have looked on the ships, we've looked at some greening initiatives, some different fuel. We're really focused on uh, greening initiatives and opportunities in the new ship. So the the new ships we awarded will actually be a hybrid ship. They can be either diesel or electric. It's a really advanced system that kind of leverages the best of technology. So we're really focused on how we can leverage existing technologies as we build those new ships. And the new Class A ships have a pretty awesome um, power plant that, that leverages some, some electrical um, technology. So we've, look, we've looked to some degree on the current ships, but it's, it's hard. Um, when some of the ships are 40, 50 years old and, and what it takes to kind of rewire and redo the whole thing, the mechanics and the electric systems that feed into them. So looking at the current fleet, but also really focused on what we can do with the so, new ships. Yeah, and well, it sounds like there are some challenges with that. Um, Stephen uh, asks another sort of very appropriate question for Earth Day. Um, if we envision a time when NOAA can replace fossil fuel aircraft and ships with uh, those powered uh, with electricity. Yeah. So an aircraft, I mean, I know the G550, well, so let me back up a minute. I mentioned that in the P3s, we put on new wings engines and avionics. In the engines, we used um, Rolls-Royce 3.5 and have noticed a significant fuel savings um, with those engines. So again, in places we can replace the power plant, we can replace the equipment and, and have them be more fuel efficient we are. And we noticed a, a noticeable difference with the P3 engines, which was exciting, especially when they're on nine hour missions. So some of it's doing it with the current fleet. Um, the new ship design, like I said, seeing that hybrid design was really exciting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what that means and how we can integrate that into the future new vessels. Yeah, so I think, I think like, you know, the rest of Kind of the rest of society or the rest of the places we're seeing it's gonna it's an integrated process it's a you know a slow kind of process where we're looking at the best technology and how to integrate it within the current fleet when we do major replacements or building it Great. into the new fleet all right Definitely thank you Admiral. Uh, and here's a question we we get a lot um especially from you know aircraft enthusiasts uh, uh john and benjamin are asking if uh omao is looking at, at the uh P-8 Poseidon, uh, the Boeing P-8 Poseidon, which is a 737 variant, um, as a replacement for the P-3. Mm -hmm. So we actually just conducted an RFI, a request for information, just to solicit um, and see what airframes are out there that can meet our needs. So we wrote down all our requirements for that mission. Um, and actually just close the RFI to see what's out there. So that's how, kind of relating back to the question about acquisition, 
Um, that's how we formally do that. We use RFIs, requests for information to just solicit industry and say, this is what we need to, this is what we need to happen. This is what our requirements are. Who can meet it and how can you meet it? And then based on that, we'll go into a request for proposal and RFP, which is um, the next step in the acquisition process. So I don't know the results of that yet. They're compiling all of it, but we're definitely using those acquisition tools um, to see what is out there. Oh, to great, meet Admiral. Needs. Um, in a, a, a similar vein, um, the, the Hurricane Hunters, the P3s um, and the Air Force C-130s, uh, they use the, their propeller driven. Uh, but we're often asked, uh, and, and Thomas posed this question yeah. as well, is uh, why, why propeller planes instead of jets for those, uh, those inside the hurricane flights? Yeah, you definitely need a propeller aircraft to go in the storm. Um, people have tried to take uh, jets in there and it's it's not good. They just can't perform the same way in that environment. So that's why you'll see the P3s and the C130s are operating in those environments. They're just not uh, made for okay. jet engines. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the question. Um, turning now to uh, people and culture, uh, Janet uh, has commented that she appreciates the emphasis on uh, caring for the for the people during the pandemic. Um, what has worked so far and what additional programs or resources do you anticipate becoming available as we potentially transition yeah. back to in-person work? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think operating COVID's been, um, I don't know if different is the word, but right, operating ships and operating aircraft, we had to keep going, right? The hurricane season came and as probably all of you know, last year was busier than ever. So the hurricanes weren't stopping for COVID and we had to get out there and collect that data, just like our other missions, right? The, we had to keep the ports and the waterways safe. We had to collect the fisheries data. So we had to figure out how to keep operating in the operational environment safely. Um, that's involved uh, shelter in places. That's involved the best possible COVID testing, the PCR testing possible and putting contracts in place, um, having hotel contracts, having contract tracing. So we've done 60, or I'm sorry, doing, um, uh, Contact tracing when we have people who have symptoms or have been around people with symptoms, but also screening. So we've done 60,000 daily screenings just to, you know, monitor people day after day and make sure we're not seeing any changing trends. So it has definitely been hard on people just to be away and be in that restrictive um, environment. Once the ships sail, we try to keep them in a 45 day bubble. So that means once they sail, right? So people shelter in place, they test. Once everyone gets a negative test, the ship is clean. The people move on and then they stay on that ship for about 45 days. Even if they come to port in that window, everyone that's sailing again has to stay on the ship. Um, the only new people out on had to go through that whole process to get on board. So that's how we've kept people safe, but it definitely comes um, with a strain. So we've done things like um, try to increase our VSAT or our internet bandwidth just to give people more capability to you know, connect with home, connect with loved ones um, for, you know, keep morale up. Um, given longer breaks between ports, so put more time when we break those bubbles for people to have some time to rest and recharge. Um, trying to find ways to safely mitigate uh, the protocols so that they can get some leave, which is hard um, just on people being gone so long. So on the flip side, right, kind of on the, on the shore side, people have largely been remote and working at home, as I'm sure many of you have been. So now is you know, there's not a date, but as we think about what transitioning back to the office is and, you know, this is being looked at at the Department of Commerce and NOAA levels, but like what will people expectations, how will their expectations change and, you know, what have we become better at doing remotely or with technological assets that, you know, we need to carry into the workplace as we kind of go back to normal, um, I guess to call it, I don't know that we'll ever be back to what it was before. So I, it's just a constant conversation and thinking about what tools there are and how to use them to keep people safe, but also to keep them, you know, mentally charged, keep their morale up, be cognizant of the, the stresses that everyone is dealing with, whether it's elderly parents, kids out of school, right? Everyone has a different stress during this and it's just maintaining that awareness. And the last comment is, you know, we've been sharing a lot of tools on stress, on mental wellness, um, holding seminars to talk about those things making sure there's resources available if people need to talk about um, stresses or impacts that they're feeling. So it's really just a constant effort to understand where people are and meet them where they are and proactively, 
you know, try to provide those tools and those outlets. There's no, there's no perfect answer. There's no, you know, straightforward answer. It's just a continual iterative process. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Meg Alex. was also asking about, you know, achieving that work-life balance. Um, you know, as a core officer and a senior NOAA leader, I mean, how do you achieve to work that? Uh, you know, achieve. How do you work to achieve that balance and promote that with NOMAO specifically? Yes. Yeah, so it's definitely a challenge. I mean, the times that you're deployed, you know, on the ships and on the aircraft, and a lot of the civilians, you know, will spend 20, 30 years on a ship rather than a two or three year assignment. And it's a, you know, it can be um, a strain on people. So it's really trying to balance and take time off where you can find the outlets that work for you. So I love to read, like reading's a good outlet, spending time uh, with my family, you know, being very intentional about the time I spend working and making it as effective as possible, you know, really being thoughtful about where the other team members are and who might need a break or who might need need help so and and i for me it's been a learning process just to figure out who i am and be authentic to that person so not try to rely on the tools or the routines that work for someone else but really know who i am and what works for me and how i need to recharge my batteries to be present and focused for the rest of the team so I'd say it's probably the biggest thing is just knowing who you are and what works for you and leaning on other people when you need it. But it's it's a constant process. It's definitely not a all right. One Thank you, Admiral. Uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about uh, the NOAA Corps. Um, Ryan is asking about student interns. Um, the the NOAA Corps uh, he, mm -hmm. he thinks would be uh, interesting to many of them, um, and we've seen that. Uh, what is the best way uh, to explore that path? So that's a very timely question, Ryan. Um, in December, we have approval for the NOAA Corps Amendment Act. So that was in the works for more than 10 years. And just due to the support of so many wonderful people, it was passed. So the NOAA Corps currently was um, capped to 321 officers. And this Amendment Act allows us to grow to 500 officers. Over time, it will be many years uh, to grow to that capacity. But it also gives us a lot of permissions we didn't have before. Um, and it will help us uh, look at things like tuition reimbursement and internship programs. Um, and so we are digging into it right now. I just had a call before this to understand some of the other internship programs um, that are in NOAA and how we can start to implement those uh, toward in the NOAA core or people that are working towards getting in the NOAA core more effectively. So your question is timely because it is definitely one of the top things I'm working on right now. But I agree with you, you know, offering internships, I think especially you know, between sophomore, junior, junior, senior level for people that are interested in the NOAA Corps would be really important. Get people at the Aircraft Operations Center, get them at our headquarters at one of our Marine Centers so they can see what we do, they can be part of it, they can offer their ideas and their their expertise and then, you know, hopefully come into the NOAA Corps. So we do have internships right now. Um, they're not geared specifically toward the NOAA Corps. So we're looking to expand, you know, how we do them and where we do them. So I would say, stay tuned. The NOAA Corps recruiters uh, will be your best resource to share opportunities as we as we get all of the the legal permissions and paperwork and plans in place. But we are aggressively working. All right. Towards uh, that. Thank you, Admiral, and we appreciate that question. Uh, so while we're on the subject, uh, can you talk a bit about your path uh, to the NOAA Corps and, and your experience as a pilot and you were a fisheries observer? You've, you've had a, uh, a pretty wide-ranging career. You've worked with uncrewed systems um, and I think that's when I, I first worked with you. Uh, really exciting stuff. You always seem to be in the mix uh, you know, with the most you know, exciting technology and, and doing great things. So can you tell us a little bit more about your your path to the NOAA Corps? Sure. So I'll, I'll do, I'll go back a little bit in time just to set the stage and, and maybe identify with some of you. So I grew up in Illinois. I was the first generation in my family not to grow up on a farm. So definitely was not geared towards the ocean. Um, but at an early age, I think I had exposure in kindergarten to a woman who had sailed around the world and that was it. I was going into marine science and never changed my mind. So um, studied marine science um, in undergraduate in San Diego and then uh, started out as a fisheries observer. So worked on fishing boats in Honolulu, Hawaii, and just loved being at sea. I loved being around fisheries. 
Um, after that, served on a deckhand on one of the NOAA ships as what's called a GVA or a general vessel assistant, which you do whatever they tell you. You might work in the galley one day, cooking meals. You might work in the engine room the next day, work on deck the next day, um, helping with uh, fisheries surveys. And I just love being on the ship, but I really loved um, being on the bridge of the ship and wanted to drive the ship and be involved in the operation. So after being a scientist for a little bit um, and sailing on the NOAA ships and academic ships as a scientist, I came into the NOAA Corps. That was my introduction to it was seeing it that way. And I really came in, you know, with an interest in everything. I wanted to sail. I wanted to fly. I wanted to dive. I was a diver. Um, really just love the mission and wanted to be involved in whatever way I could add value. So, I mean, I think one thing I learned along the way is just being open-minded and looking for the opportunities around you will go a long ways. Um, when I worked in Hawaii as, as a scientist, you know, the man I shared an office with, someone will come in and say, Nancy, do you want to do this? I said, yes. And he said, you don't even know what you're doing. And I said, I want to do it, whatever it is. And uh, one time it was, well, let's go on the, the ship and go in the deep sea submersible. So we got to do that the Hawaiian Islands. So it's just really maintaining an open mind and doing something that you love. I mean, being there because you love it and you're contributing, um, I think is the most important thing. And that's really just led me from opportunity to opportunity, just wanting to leave it better than I found it, wanting to contribute, wanting to serve and just genuinely loving the mission and believing in the mission. So I think just find what you love and follow it. Don't let people tell you that you can't. Plenty of the people along the way told me I couldn't do things and I just, you know, figured that I'd I'd figure out a way to do it and, you know, figure out the people who could mentor me and support me. So find what you love and, and don't give up would be my mission and Absolutely. it will lead you to a lot so, of amazing uh, things. Did you ever get a chance to go down on a submarine or, or use one for research? You did? Yeah. I did. I did. I went in the Pisces, which is the sister submersible to the Alvin. So oh. it's called the KOK, which was a University of Hawaii ship that's now decommissioned. And uh, we went down in the Hawaiian Islands and studied, I guess it was one of the newest islands that's coming up. So we went down, it was about an eight hour dive and it was that's really, great. really yeah. talk, talk about Im immersing yourself in your work. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but yeah, just keep an open mind. Say yes a lot, try new things, figure out how you can add right, value. Right. It opens uh, a lot of doors. So can you talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, uncrewed systems? I mean, that's that's the hot topic these days. Everyone's talking about drones. Sure. Uh, they want to know more. Um, do, you, sure. do you expect them yeah. to eventually um, replace our ships and aircraft, or do you think they're complementary systems, or, or where, do you think, where do you think drones fit in the equation? Yeah. So that's a good question. So I've been working on uncrewed systems since 2004 when I was assigned to the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab. And at the time, um, there was a scientist there in the Hurricane Research Division looking at the first generations of using a uncrewed aircraft system to fly into hurricanes. Again, you know, filling that data gap at the air-sea interface, it's so critical to the accurate forecast, but you don't want to fly an aircraft down there and buoys get blown out of the way. It's just such a hard data set to collect in the storm environment. So 2004, I was there and, you know, I went up to the scientists and said, hey, can I help? Like I have a background in operations. I'll figure out how to get you clearance with the FAA. And so that's how I got involved and have been involved um, since then, both, both in aircraft and marine. So, you know, that continues. We're on the fourth generation of that platform. And that's the one that's launched from the P3, which is really amazing technology. And, and we'll be, we have two um, new platforms that will launch into hurricanes um, this season from the P3. Um, also had the opportunity to go to Antarctica. So the penguin uh, and the seal colonies there have traditionally been counted by scientists by hand and with photographs. And you know, realize there's a real opportunity to get a small like hexacopter, quadrocopter up in the air with a camera and collect collect that imagery um, to help do the counts and do the the life abundance surveys. So was fortunate to be in the first team that went down there to figure out how to do that. And we had you know. Some trials and errors, we figured out what worked and what didn't work. But through those missions, and then with the input of the scientists, so I've largely see them as a force multiplier. In most instances, they'll help us collect better data sets, more complete data sets, right? Fill in the gaps like at that air-sea interface. Um, 
from the ships and aircraft and the field-based operations. But there are cases, you know, where they can collect better data, better, better data um, than, for instance, the aircraft. So one example is on the Lucian Islands, way out in the Alaska chain. You know, we try to operate twin auto aircraft out there, but it's hard. There's not a lot of airfields. The weather is very temperamental. So having an alternate air airfield, which is where you need to get back to in a certain amount of time before you run out of fuel, and balancing the changing weather conditions up there makes it hard to get the twin otter out there and study um, stellar sea lines, which are really important to the, the pollock uh, fishery quotas up there. But uncrewed systems, a, a field party launch with uncrewed systems can get out there. And if they just have an hour window, they can get up and fly and collect the data they need. So that's an instance where it's replaced the aircraft because it can do the mission better. But in most cases, it's a force multiplier. And as we looked at the recapitalization of the big ships and aircraft, like I talked about, you know, there was a lot of it informed by the scientists who said, no, they're not ready to be replaced. Um, the technology isn't there and, and not sure when it will be there, but it's not any time in the next, you know, 30 to 40 years is what they told us. So a lot of great additions filling the gaps but not wholesale replacements at this time i think i'll mention one other thing i think hydrographic mapping is a good example so you map from the big ship you send launches out you know six launches out and those can get in shallower water and collect data but again there's that near shore area where you can't take a launch because it's too shallow rocky dangerous that's where an uncrewed marine system can fill in and collect the data so again filling in those filling in that data around the gaps to get a better so product the, it sounds like they service. are a very important tool in the toolbox not the solution for everything um, but uh, really getting us to where we need to go to get the data in in many cases so uh, very exciting uh, just I want to touch Agreed. on uh, partnerships so we yeah. you mentioned that a few times um, you know, uh, obviously, we work with you know, the uh, agencies like EPA and, and Navy, um, Coast Guard as well. I mean, to, to what extent do we do we work with the the other uh, uniform services? Of course, there you know, NOCOR being one of one of the eight. Uh, so, can you can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. No, so that's a good question. So. Um, Coast Guard, very close relationship with the Coast Guard. We train at the Coast Guard Academy. That's where our officers train. That's where our officers come back and do refresher training um, before they get back uh, underway at sea in their sea assignments. Um, we have officers on their Coast Guard cutter. Um, we have a liaison officer there. So a lot of, a lot of interaction with the Coast Guard, a lot of um, mission similarities um, with the Navy. Uh, working very closely with them on uncrewed systems. Um, they have some of their meteorologists sail with us on the ships to help just gain experience and see what we do and us to learn from them. Um, at the combatant commands, like I mentioned, we work alongside them to, for example, we've used our ships to, or they've used their ships to pick people up off the Northwest Hawaiian Islands when storms are coming in. Um, we've deployed buoys, working with them right now to deploy buoys in the hurricanes this summer to help collect better meteorological data. So it is just a constant conversation and identification of how we can work together. Um, the Air Force, so we actually were on the Air Force Base, uh, McDill Air Force Base, before they needed the space back and we moved to Lakeland, but we still work closely with them um, on a lot of aircraft missions. As you mentioned, they fly the C-130s. So Often their C-130 and our P-3 are in the storm at the same time. Um, a lot of the instrumentation that is developed will be developed by NOAA and then put on the C-130. So a lot of work together on instrumentation development uh, for operations. Public health service, as I mentioned, is an integral part of our workforce, a very important part. Um, Army, actually, we just conducted a class with the Army for diving medicine. So DMO, diving medical officers, that was a joint um, effort that we now have a five-year MOU to do that uh, with the Army. So a lot of their special operations from the Army and other services uh, rely on us uh, for their dive training. Our instructors go, you know, we share resources and learn from each other. So there, you know, this could be a whole two-hour conversation just on all the places we work with other, um, other services, but it's such an important part of what we do and also you know, a lot of value that and we You could really so uh, say the same good. about our, our university partners as well, right? Agreed. Agreed fully. So I mentioned we have um, 
you know, 10 year agreement with the University of Southern Mississippi. We have an agreement with Scripps and work very closely with them on aircraft projects, um, development of buoys, uh, uncrewed projects. Um, there's academic institutions we work with across the United States and they're so important. They, the academic uh, research fleet, so they have their own fleet of ships. We often sail on their ships, they sail on our ships. Uh, we're working very closely with them now. They have three ships that are very similar to the Ron Brown. They're called sister ships. They just completed midlife maintenance, which is a major uh, maintenance endeavor, about year long of work um, on two of their ships. And we'll now be doing it on the Ron Brown and have worked closely with them on lessons learned on developing the package. So again, that could be a whole conversation, just all the ways we work together. Um, the last thing I'll mention is our G550, the aircraft we're bringing on. Um, they, uh, NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, is developing the Dropson system. So we work with them on the Dropson system, which is such an important component of collecting the, the data in hurricanes and other storm um, weather environments. Um, we're actually working with German Aerospace. They have a G550 on leveraging their nose boom um, and some of the design work on their aircraft. So it just extends on and on. And we are always NOAA and the universities are always looking for ways that we can, you know, work together to use our collective resources and technologies. So, again, Absolutely. the partnerships are and, so uh, important to we, what uh, we do. We definitely appreciate them and, and all the all the good folks who are uh, working behind the scenes um, in in uh, at universities and in uh, labs across the country. Um, so, uh, yeah, definitely definitely need those partners. Uh, so, uh, Admiral Amy, uh, any Okay. Anything else you want to add before we wrap today? Uh, any other points you want to touch on? No, I've really enjoyed this conversation and hopefully it's been of interest to people. And, you know, for those of you who might be early in your career, maybe in school, I mean, it's, it's an amazing career just in the sciences. So find, like I said, find what you love and, and stick with it and, you know, you'll be amazed how the opportunities unfold. And, you know, I guess for people at every level of your, your life or your professional development, you know, I'd encourage you to always look around for someone that you can help bring along, someone that you can, you know, mentor or answer questions or invite them um, to do things with you because, you know, it's, it's sometimes we lose sight of what that seed is that we plant in someone, right? That one moment that you took time to talk to someone or you showed them something or you took interest in them and that seed often becomes being the thing that they love and you know encourages them and gives them the confidence to do it so yeah I'd say we're all in this together and 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 definitely you know look forward to the the future generation to make it even better than it is now most of thank all you, just thank Roland. you for the uh, time thanks and really uh, thanks to our uh, entire team and and to uh, all those tuning in today we really appreciate your questions uh, we hope you've enjoyed the presentation you can uh, learn more about the office of marine aviation operations on our website which is www.omao.noaa.gov uh, and you can also uh, check out the NOAA Corps website at uh, noacore.noaa.gov and of course follow us on our uh, many social media channels, and, and we hope you do. Um, we've got some great content out there, uh, and uh, including this Earth Day, so uh, we appreciate that. So uh, I'll put some URLs in the chat, and uh, then I will uh, turn it back over to uh, to Tracy, or not. Great. Admiral Hahn, thank you so much for a terrific and informative talk. I was just amazed by all the stuff that's going on at OMAO. And I want to thank David Hall and Wendy Lewis for uh, helping to moderate the questions. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Our next NOAA Leadership Seminar is on May 11th and is titled Embracing the Chaos, Lessons Learned from Organizational <laughs> Change in NESDIS by AJ Mehta of NOAA's National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. So we hope you can join us, and we hope to see you next month. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Admiral. Thanks, Bye. David. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.